That wasn't a bad thing. <laughs> funding is through the Department of Energy and Ames Laboratory. We've been interested in, in uh, this particular system, copper ruthenium, for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first one is that it is an interesting bimetallic system considering that copper and ruthenium are invisible in the bulk. Yet obviously, as Sinfeld had shown 15 years ago, there's a strong interaction between copper and ruthenium that greatly affects the catalytic activity. The other interesting thing about this system is that there is an apparent disagreement or at least a discrepancy between, between results on, on single crystals and a supportive catalyst, and it's that particular discrepancy that I want to wish to address this morning. I think part of the discrepancy is due to uh, perhaps a, a semantic problem, so let me throw out some definitions here that, that I will be using in this talk, and these may not be the definitions that we use a year from now, but I, I think it's important for us to understand specifically what we're talking about. In terms of structure sensitivity, like the last talk, what I mean is, is the catalytic phenomenon is, is strongly influenced by the surface metal coordination. That would be, for example, uh, reactions rates varying on different crystal planes on single crystals, or on supported catalysts on various sites on the metal, you know, edges and corners as being different from single low, low index planes. Whereas a geometric effect in a multi-metallic catalyst would be primarily a mixing phenomenon. On a given surface, the catalytic activity being a function of ensemble size is more like the blended multiplet theory. Um, and I want to distinguish uh, that from coordination effects that can also be Well, the ethylene hydrogenolysis reaction is, is known to be structure sensitive. Um, for example, on nickel single crystals, Goodman has shown that, that in fact you do get different activities on different crystal planes. It's also been noted on supported platinum that uh, activities are a function of, of dispersion. And there's an interesting uh, work done by Kane and Clark. Nice studies where they put some uh, gold on platinum and showed the catalytic uh, activity in terms of turnover frequency varied with a little bit of gold. And they assumed that was due to the fact that gold tends to populate low coordination sites or defect sites in the surface. And now, as I mentioned earlier, Sinfeld and his colleagues at Exxon uh, looked at copper ruthenium as aggregate, aggregates as well as silica supported copper ruthenium and implied that there are geometric effects on this particular catalyst. And that's really the, the crux of the controversy here. Uh, when you look at single crystals, as uh, Peg and Goodman did and published in 86, if you take a single crystal surface of ruthenium and put a little copper down on it, you don't apparently get that geometric effect. There's no variation in the turnover frequency for this reaction with the addition of copper. Whereas in, in a nice paper in, in 87 by Kim Sinfeld and, and some colleagues looking at some spectroscopies of uh, supported and aggregate catalysts, the copper is doing something different in that system than it is doing on single crystals, and they suggest that perhaps uh, support, uh, single crystals are not a good model for this particular system. But going to what we've done here, uh, we made some standard uh, catalysts uh, using silica as a support. In the metal salts used for the impregnation, we used the nitrates to avoid the chlorine contamination. We've done some earlier work with this particular catalyst and reaction system where we use ruthenium chloride trichloride as a ruthenium salt. It does make a, a bit of a difference, I think, in the results that we have obtained. I want to point out that all catalysts have 4% by weight of ruthenium, and we vary the copper content to look at the variation of composition. And the reaction conditions are, are one atmosphere, a little bit lower than 500 degrees Kelvin now, but I don't know if I have that data in the slide, and the hydrogen to ethane ratio is about 5 to 1. It's all done in a to do a differential reactor. Well, let's go to the results. 
uh, for this particular system. We have plotted here the rate in terms of uh, moles of methane produced per second per total mole of ruthenium in the catalyst as a function of the copper content of the metal portion of that catalyst. And looking at this uh, data, you see, for example, the low temperatures, we start off with a fairly high activity for the pure ruthenium on silica catalyst, but as we add copper, the activity goes down by quite a lot. In fact, by the time we add about 20% of the total metal being a copper, we have an, an activity of over an order of magnitude lower than the pure catalyst. In fact, when we get down to here, we can't, we can't do the uh, analysis very well because the GC isn't that sensitive. So we uh, go to a higher temperature, we get another uh, set of data. If we go to a higher temperature still, this is 548 Kelvin. The activity is too large for the pure catalyst, but once we get out here, we can see it well enough and so we can back off to quite a bit higher composition in copper to get a good set of, of reaction rate data. Now again, this is the rate per total ruthenium in the catalyst, and to analyze the system, we want turnover frequency. Uh, and so we have to know the amount of ruthenium at the surface of this catalyst. But I'm sure most of you are aware now that, that uh, Hydrogen will spill over from ruthenium to copper. And so if you try to do uh, titration using selective hydrogen chemisorption, you get results which are, are not very meaningful. This, uh, for example, the top line here shows the relative amount of strong hydrogen chemisorption as a function of copper content. And you see that there's essentially no change in the total for the strong hydrogen chemisorption as you add copper. Now, if you use the ruthenium chloride as a salt, you actually do see a drop off in the um, strong hydrogen chemisorption, but only by about a factor of two, isn't it? It's, a good, it's not a good indicator of the surface composition. So what we've done is uh, something we've talked about in the past, uh, using uh, NMR of, of hydrogen adsorbed on the surface, and I'm, I'm just showing the, the uh, spectra here for these catalysts, just to show you what they look like. There's essentially two peaks, one for the hydroxyl proton and one for hydrogen on metal, top one being pure ruthenium. As we add copper, this peak shifts. And as we're down to this point, the surface is essentially pure copper. So what we have here is hydrogen on, on pure copper, on copper sitting on top of ruthenium. And from the position of this peak, we can determine the surface compositions. We've got a fast exchange peak. So the position is sort of a weighted average of the relative amounts of, of ruthenium and copper. For example, this is the, the shift in ppm as a function of copper content. You see it goes from value a little over 60 in asymptotes to a value down here. And this is, in fact, you can just read this as, as ruthenium, relative ruthenium concentration of the surface if you wanted to translate directly into that. Given that information, we can find the turnover frequencies now for this reaction. And this is the results that I, I want to show you today. Um, let's look at the low temperature first. Here we have turnover frequency in terms of rate for surface ruthenium atom. At this low temperature, you see we add a little bit of copper. The rate does decrease until we hit about 10% uh, total copper in the catalyst. And then it seems to level out. Uh, we don't have any more data out here because the rate, the absolute rate is too low. If you look at the highest temperature, this, this level turnover frequency seems to be true. We can add quite a bit of copper, and the turnover frequency does not change. Okay, so apparently what we're seeing here is, is Something that's happening early on is we have a little bit of copper, and then after a while, the turnover frequency varies. Now let me tell you what we think is going on, and I'll come back to that slide. If we look at some <coughs> illustrative pictures here of, of uh, some Monte Carlo simulations, another one of my students has done, and look at varying amounts of copper, the copper being the light atoms in this, in this model, you see that roughly 2% uh, of the metal being copper Copper tends to go to low coordination sites, edges and corners and so on, around this surface. About 5% copper, we're populating almost exclusively those edge and corner sites. At 10% copper, we've pretty much populated those low coordination sites. There's still a few left. Now the copper is beginning to cover up the other, uh, the other spaces on the surface. In fact, here's the 15% copper. We've lost all the edges and corners, and now we're working on uh, the low index point. Now the curious thing about this is if you go to 20 and 30 percent copper, you never ever get to the point where you're building or making small ensembles of ruthenium. In fact, even out here at 30 percent copper, where the surface is almost entirely copper, we still have large ensembles of ruthenium. So what we think is happening here is this, uh, at this low temperature, this initial decrease in activity is due to the 
loss of edge and corner sites for the Kadeem. In fact, uh, it turns out in the simulations, 10% is where we lose all those edge and corner sites. And so it appears to be a structure sensitive reaction in the sense that those edges and corners have a different activity than the base. <laughs> Once we fill up those edges and corners, the activity of the turnover frequency looks like it does on a single crystal. We're just covering up the surface and blocking sites. We're not making a small ensembles of the There's no geometric effect here. Another curious phenomenon here is the fact that to go to a slightly higher temperature, we don't see this fall off in activity initially. And if you go to the higher temperature, we don't have the data for the pure ruthenium, but if you extrapolate it from some data that we have here for the pure ruthenium and, and uh, use an activation energy, it comes to a point that's about here, saying that the, uh, the edges and corners now are in lower activity than they are at the base point. And the reason for that is the uh, activation energy very significantly as we add copper. Uh, initially, the pure ruthenium has an activation energy close to 130 kilojoules per mole. As we add copper and fill up those low coordination sites, the edges and corners, the uh, activation energy jumps up to a value close to 190 kilojoules. Since the activation energy on those base planes then is higher than it is on the edges and corners, at low temperatures, we get a higher activity for the edges and corners. But at the higher temperature, we essentially get a crossover in the relative rates so that we have now a higher activity on the base plane than we just get in the corner. Looks like I threw out the right number of slides, but it's pretty much on time. So let me go to the conclusions here. Um, we would conclude that ethane hydrogenolysis then is a structure sensitive reaction uh, due to the fact that we see the activity change so much uh, as we add copper. That primarily populates edge and corner sites. But once those edge and corner sites are populated, it looks like a single crystal system. There are no geometric effects of this catalyst at that point. Um, and, and even if uh, this reaction were perhaps influenced by geometric considerations, we would not see it with copper ruthenium because of the mixing properties of that system do not, do not allow the production of small ensembles. Thank you. Show the cost of sitting in the, the particle structure, let's say. Uh, is that a, a true representation of what probably happens, or is the copper adsorbed? Them, well, we, we've actually uh, done some simulations where copper is sitting on top. And in fact, if you start with the configuration, it looks like that. It pretty much stays that way as well. I, I think that's probably a more correct picture of what's going on. It's just harder to see the results when you don't when you have something nice and geometric to compare with. That's probably correct. I'm trying to relate your work to Gary Howard. Uh, I'm looking at the catalyst cell that you use. You use the HS5, and that's right. structure sensitive. Uh, Simfeld uses the HS5, if I believe. And if you go to the M5, you get a different set of results. It's apparently related to the hydroxyl concentration on the, on the silica. And my question is, have you have you tried to, to, to duplicate your results using the M5 rather than the HS5? No, we haven't. And, and as I recall, our results are slightly different than the areas with the, the hydrogen absorption on, on this capital cell uh, support. I think you, you see uh, <coughs> strong hydrogen <coughs> pretty much invariant with the content. He does see a fall off. I'm not sure why there's a difference in that. I remember his model in the HS5, he has copper sort of on the edges of the ruthenium particle, and then the M5, it decorates the whole particle. And the difference in the, in the copper right. overlayer. Right. I, I, well, we haven't tried to duplicate that work. I'm not sure. I, I gather that your conclusion from the simulations about the large islands of the team is. is in some sense sensitive to the copper-copper interaction energy and how that interaction energy is moderated by the copper ruthenium bonding. Can you say anything about how you handle the energetics in this problem? Well, the, the, yeah, the energetics are really important here. And in, in doing these types of simulations, we do t try to account for the fact that bond energies of the surface are different than they are in the bulk of these materials. Now, the curious thing about copper ruthenium is that they're so different cohesive energies of those materials are so different and they don't mix that, that the results are, are not too sensitive to what kind of 
interaction with the user unit. And I think in general for biometallic systems, anytime you have a system which has almost no mixing, uh, you will not get small ensemble. But you will get that segregation of local coordination cycle. How do you separate the crystallized size effect from the compositional effect? Well, that was uh, in this study, we, we tried to maintain roughly the same dispersion, total dispersion, by using the same amount of ruthenium, just small amounts of copper added to it. So in that case, we tried to eliminate that, that problem. Yeah, but as you add the other component, it might change the... Well, you, know, you notice on the hydrogen chem absorption, <coughs> the total amount of hydrogen chem absorption, the total amount of strong hydrogen chem absorption did not change significantly over there. So we interpret that as the amount of significant change in the particle size. <coughs> Ah, let's see. You're ready. Done. Did you um, put the two salts together and reduce these? I, I didn't uh, remember. It was a coin coordination. Because uh, have you ever tried like putting the four percent ruthenium down, you know, getting rid of the precursor, and then adding um, four? Uh, yeah, and then adding the copper. Because that might. <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> I guess we tried mechanically. Because that might be a better way to keep the ruthenium surface uh, the same. And also, it might answer the question of whether these things sit on top or in. Because if the two salts are together, I don't think I don't have a problem with how you have them sitting in the Q octahedron, the, the copper. Might as well. well, the energies really don't favor an add atom on the surface. That's really strongly uh, not. It'd be favorite. interesting to see if there was already a chunk of ruthenium. It's probably a lot harder to break it up to put copper in. Right. Good point. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jerry. Uh, I already advertised the next talks, but.